、えー、皆さんこんばんは、えー、ご紹介いただきました岐阜県知事の古田でございます Good evening ladies and gentlemen、uh, I am a, a governor of 岐阜 prefecture はじめ古田あのご紹介ありました通り私は桜井理事長のオールドフレンドでかつ、えー、オールドでございます As kindly introduced I'm an old friend of the president Sakurai of Japan society and I am old えー、Get to Know Japan シリーズということで、石川県、沖縄県に続いて、私ども岐阜県が今日こういう形で、えー、紹介していただけることを心から嬉しく思っております。It is a great pleasure that this、uh, Gifu Prefecture is、uh, featured as a Get to Know Japan series, a third one after the Ishikawa Prefecture and Okinawa. おいでいただいた皆様に感謝すると同時に、えー、ご協力いただきました桜井理事長、えー、またジャパンソサイティの,あのスタッフの方々、えー、そしてまたスポンサーの方々に心から御礼申し上げます。I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for being here tonight, as well as the President Sakurai of the Japan Society and all of those staff of the Japan Society who has helped to organize this, as well as the sponsors of this event. Thank you very much. ところで私自身、1987年から90年まで、このニューヨークに勤めておりました。I myself was stationed here in New York for my work from 1987 to 1990. 当時、このジャパンソサイティに参りますと、ほぼ決まったテーマでいろんな議論が行われておりました。At that time, when I come to Japan society, there was always this、uh, the certain theme that the everybody was discussing all the time when I visit. ままAs I recall, such themes they are namely、えー、Japan as number one. <laughs>、ね、so you laughed, right? <laughs> 日米貿易戦争、ジャパン、US ・ジャパン・トレード・ウォー、ジャパン・バッシング、リフォーミスト、えー、といったテーマで、えー、いろんな議論が行われておりました。So, all these themes of Japan bashing, of this、uh, Japan and US trade wars, or the reformist type of criticism, it was a quite a heated argument. また、バイイング・イント・アメリカと。いうテーマもございました今回私は1週間でニューヨーク・ワシントンをお邪魔しております。Uh, time, テーマは4つでございます。第一に岐阜県の観光、食材、ものづくりのキャンペーンでございます。One is the trade mission to promote Gifu Prefecture's、uh, tourism and the various products and the、uh, various features of the handcrafts and so forth. もう一つは、この後ご紹介がありますが、えー、杉原千畝の命のビザ、えー、これをユネスコの世界記憶遺産に登録していただこうということで、こちらのユダヤの関係者の方々、サバイバーの方々との協議でございます。The second objective of the mission was to、uh, actually disseminate this、uh, new information about Chiune Sugihara, the、uh, former consul of Japan、uh, to Lithuania, who has issued visa for life for the Jewish refugees,、uh, which we have. Uh, the applied for the nomination of the designation of the memory of the world by UNESCO, and the, we had met with the Jewish community here in New York. The third uh, the objective was to uh, have uh, this uh, mission. To、uh, disseminate the information on our、uh, battlegrounds in Gifu Prefecture called Sekigahara, where in the 1600、uh, AD there was a very decisive battle that has actually been fought by the East and West forces in Japan, and that, was,、uh, that had the fate 
decided the fate of Japan. この関ヶ原と南北戦争のゲティスバーグとの間で、えー、協力協定、交流協定を結ぶのが3番目の目的でございます。So therefore, our objective of the mission was to have、uh, this conclusion of the agreement of the partnership Uh, friendship, friendship ties with the Gettysburg, this also the historical battlefield of the United States with Sekigahara of Gifu Prefecture. And the Sekigahara and the Gettysburg agreed. To the fact that、uh, we would cherish this,、uh, the, the remembrance of the war as、uh, something、uh, that、uh, we would disseminate peace on the grounds that,、uh, of this、uh, historical battlefield that we will be able to carry to pass to the future generations. The fourth objective of the mission. Was the collaboration and cooperation for the aerospace、uh, the industry development? Gifu Prefecture happens to be the hub for aerospace industry in Japan.、えー今回、スミソニアン博物館、そして NASA との交流協定を結んでまいりました。So, in order to have this world class aerospace museum in Gifu Prefecture,、uh, the, I have concluded an agreement with the Smithsonian Institute of the National Air and Space Museum and the NASA.1907、えー、年に創設されて、100年を超える伝統なるこのジャパンソサエティ、その中で1980年代の後半と、それから今日の私どものテーマのコントラストをご紹介いたしましたが、時代の変化を大きく感じておる次第でございます。So, to me, it is a personally a very much this、uh, a feel that I, that I have about this.、Uh, Time and the juncture that、uh, compared to the time that I used to be here in the Japan society,、uh, which has been established since 1907, to have such a long history, and the time when I was here in New York, and the theme today that I carry to share with you, there's so much stark difference. We have come a long way. So today, everything is about Gifu. Please feel it. とりわけ、このセッションが終わった後は、日本一のとろけるような牛肉のフォアグラとヨーロッパで形容されております、飛騨牛が皆様方をお待ちしております。Especially after the talk session, ヒダビーフ is waiting for you, which is called,、uh, which is a, a best beef in Japan, where it is termed as フォアグラ of beef. It melt in your mouth. So, in the past, Japanese beef was the topic for this US and Japan trade war as being a very much of how the American beef should be imported into Japan. 昨年の10月に日本の牛肉の輸出施設がアメリカから認可をされまして、アメリカに輸出できるようになりました。Last October, this facility in Japan, in Gifu, has been approved so that with the regulations that they are now able to export beef to United States. 飛騨牛は今日からいよいよ本格的アメリカ上陸でございます。So, Hida beef has, as of today, long,、uh, has been introduced to the American continent for the first time. So, whether it will fail or succeed in the United States, it all depends on your palate of New Yorkers who will taste it for the first time. 
好意的なコメントを期待して、私のご挨拶を終わらせていただきます。So, I count on you that you will have some favorable feedback for us. ありがとうございました。I will close my Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here tonight to be the moderator for the program. Our program tonight begins with the performance of Jikabuki, a form of kabuki theater performed by amateur actors, which is particularly vibrant in Gifu. Jikabuki began when touring shows brought professional kabuki plays from Edo and Kyoto around the country, and the local people learned the plays and started putting on performances themselves at local festivals and playhouses. Gifu Prefecture has the most active Jikabuki theater scene in Japan, with 29 troops performing. Visitors to Gifu can enjoy Jikabuki performances in theaters built more than 100 years ago and get a feel for the old days of Edo period. These amateur Jikabuki actors may be office workers, farmers, government employees by day. But each year, they put on performances that are on par with those of any pro, <laughs> attracting audiences from both Japan and abroad. In fact, this spring, the governor of Gifu himself performed on a Jikabuki stage. <clears throat> Tonight's performance is Pulling the Carriage Apart, a scene from the play Sugawara's Secrets of Cal Calligraphy. As you can see on the screen, This, is a, this scene is a spectacular play that showcases the beauty of kabuki. Tonight, three actors will perform a 10 minute excerpt from this hour long play, showing a succession of dramatic moments called mie. The script has been changed to introduce some of Gifu's charms. The performers are members of the Tono Kabuki Nakatsukawa Preservation Society from Nakatsugawa City in Gifu Prefecture. Okay. So, we're going to need some audience participation for this part, so I hope you guys are up to it. The audience's cheers play an important role in Jikabuki. When an actor strikes a dramatic pose or mie, the audience calls out. These cheers are called omuko. First, when the actor appears on stage, you will scream or yell, <laughs> Matte mashita! This, yes, this means we've been waiting to see you. All right, so let's practice together. Repeat after me. Matte mashita. Wow, it's pretty good. Okay. So let's try it when we see the actor, because you're supposed to say it when the actor appears. So let's practice once more. Matte mashita. Very good. Okay, next, when the actor strikes a mie pose, you'll yell out, Nipponichi, which means your play is the best in Japan. <laughs> And they say that for every play. All right, so watch for the cue. Nipponichi! Very good. <laughs> Finally, when the final mie pose is struck, yell out, o tari, o tari, <laughs> which means that's a huge success or you nailed it. All right, so let's try it and wait for the cue. We got a good audience tonight. Great job. Okay. So, there's one more bit of audience participation in Jikabuki that we like to share, and it's called throwing ohineri. All right, ohineri are coins wrapped in paper like this, like she's holding up, and that you throw at your favorite actor when she strikes a mie pose. An actor's family and friends will usually make on,、um, ohineri and bring them to the theater. So, when the actress strikes me, I pose during the performance, you'll take several ohineri in your hand and start throwing them gently toward the stage. So, let's watch. Nipponichi! Nip 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 
Thanks, me! Yay! <laughs> so, so tonight we prepared ohineri for the audience members in the first and second rows only. Sorry, sorry. We can have some away in the back throwing stuff. So make sure to throw them gently so they don't hit the actor, but they hit the floor kind of like flowers at a, at a performance. Okay. So that way the, peop the people will experience for themselves. We have people passing them out. Okay, I think everyone in the first and second rows has their ohineri. All right, so now without further ado, let's watch this impressive scene, pulling the carriage apart from Sugawara's Secrets of Calligraphy. And don't forget to call out when you see the cue card and throw gently your ohineri. Oh, to 
I would now like to introduce Graham Howard, who will give us a more in-depth look into Gifu Prefecture. Originally from Canada, Mr. Howard has been living in Gifu for three years. 
He serves as a coordinator for international relations for Gifu Prefecture's Tourism Promotion Division. Please welcome me, please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Graham. Hello, and thank you very much for that introduction. My name is Graham Howard, and I have been living in Gifu Prefecture for three whole years. I am a bit worried because obviously that is an incredibly difficult act to follow. I would almost like them to come up here and just do my entire presentation for me, but unfortunately, that does not seem like it's on the cards. Uh, I was born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which means uh, I am from the great Canadian tundra that is uh, the prairies. And now that we, I've got my projector here, I'd like to tell everybody a little bit more about Gifu. And after I was uh, informed that I would be speaking here at the Japan Society, I of course took a look at the different lectures that have been done here and read about the people that have spoken here and I realized that, wow, I may be the most unaccomplished speaker in the history of this society. <laughs> I'm of course fine with that. I mean, I wear that badge with pride. I am the biggest nobody and I am looking forward to having you all on this journey with me. And having lived in Gifu for over three years, uh, I have been through much of the prefecture, be it on work or, you know, for personal travel. And I say much and not all, because despite having lived there for as long as I have, it's really amazing how it always finds another way to surprise me. And I am aware that, I mean, we do have some citizens of Gifu in the audience, so there may be some experts out there. You may be thinking to yourself, Graham, there's nothing you can tell me about Gifu that I don't already know. And that's fine, thank you for coming anyway. But if you manage to stay awake, uh, I may have a thing or two that can surprise you. For many of us, however, this will be our very first time learning about Gifu Prefecture, so I'd like to get us started with a very brief overview, a Gifu 101, if you will. And as you can see it, Gifu is located in the very center of Japan, uh, which makes it very convenient in many ways. The first one is transit. It's very close to its nearest airport, Central Japan International Airport, just one hour away. And if you're traveling by Shinkansen bullet train, which all of us do, and everybody who travels to Japan always feels like they need to ride it, and I do recommend it, it's just two hours away from Tokyo, one hour away from Osaka, or a very short 40 minutes away from Kyoto. Perfectly located, really. And I imagine there are some people in the audience who have been to Japan or are planning a trip in the future. And if you are, just remember that so long as you are on the main island of Honshu, right in the middle of Japan, Gifu is never very far away or very hard to get to. And so really, sorry for everybody here, that just means you have no excuses. <laughs> And if anybody had the chance to take a, a look at our PR booth, or even just look at the program, the name of the event today, we like to call Gifu the heartland of Japan. Part of that is that it is centrally located, yes, but there is another reason behind that. As Japan, and most of the world for that matter, continues its unstoppable march towards modernity, many cities like Tokyo or Osaka embrace that technological advancement in the name of a cool Japan. Gifu, uh, on the other hand, is a place where the original heart and soul of the country are embraced and tradition is treasured. Time is a precious thing and I'm sure I could waste your entire evening telling you everything I know about Gifu, but for tonight I'd like to focus on two things, the authentic and the culinary, one of those I feel you may be more interested in. <laughs> and I'll start with one of our usual suspects, the UNESCO World Heritage Site of Shirakawa Go. It was designated as such in 1995, and it shares that honor with the village of Gokayama, which is in the neighboring prefecture of Toyama. I mean, just seeing these pictures should probably be enough to convince you, and I mean, make you understand why it has the reputation that it does. And what you see before you are called thatched roof gasho zukuri houses. Zukuri simply means construction, and gasho refers to the shape that hands make when they are clasped together in prayer. Shirakawago sits in a valley, deep up in the mountains, sort of sitting at the entranceway to the northern Japan Alps. As such, it is one of the snowiest areas, snowiest areas in the region, and as you can see, the shape of the houses here is made to accommodate the weight of the snowfall. By distributing it to the sides, it prevents the house from being crushed, and you can't tell this from looking at it, but no nails are used in its construction. Obviously, the roofs are made in a shape that's such uh, 
that it will not be destroyed by the snow, but also in the event of a typhoon or an earthquake, it is also very resistant to wind and shaking. So it will shake, but it won't fall down. And during my time in Gifu Prefecture, be it for work or guiding friends and family, I have been to Shirakawa Go again, and again, and again. And honestly, the greatest words of praise that I have for the place are that, having been there over 20 times, I'm still not tired of it. And you might wonder, I mentioned uh, Gokayama earlier, why should I visit Shirakawa, uh, why should I visit Shirakawa Go instead of Toyama? Uh, the village of Gokayama. And there is one main reason for that. In Gokayama, these houses that you see are spread across multiple settlements. If you were to visit Shirakawa Go, you can get over 100 of them in the exact same spot. Some of them are just normal residences, others are souvenir shops, there are restaurants, and some of them are actually guest houses that you can stay the night inside of. That makes it very unique in that it is a world heritage site that you can stay the night at. We also like to say that Shirakawa Go is a living World Heritage Site. And by that, of course, we mean that unlike other locations, it is not a simple museum. It's not a place that's kept behind glass, protected from the people who live in it or visit it. But we also have tremendous amounts of visitors who come. Uh, but the people who live here just go about their days as usual. One of my favorite memories here is uh, late one night, I was guiding a guest from America, and one of the doors of these ancient houses swung open and two children, a boy and a girl, ran outside in their soccer uniforms, yelling at their mom that they would be late for practice. So even if it is this kind of old heritage site, there are still regular people going about their regular lives. And I mentioned that you can stay the night, and of course those are run by the people who live there. So what you do is you just join other guests around the fireplace, they put out food for the entire group, and you enjoy it as you would have if you were a family there. And of course, there are many people who, when they go on vacation, they don't want to just see things, they want to do something. They want to engage, engage with and really experience the area that they're visiting. In the town of Hida Furukawa, which as you can see here is stunning in the wintertime, you can get up and close with a more rural, down-to-earth side of the country that you really can't get in most other places. There's an activity called Satoyama Experience, where knowledgeable, bilingual guides take you on a bike ride through the village, telling you everything there is to know. The time I did it myself, I learned about the town's thriving Spanish economy. I saw a ranch where they raised cows that would have the distinct honor of becoming Gifu's famous heat of beef. And the guides were all very well known around town. So if you'd like to strike up a conversation with the locals, it's surprisingly easy to do. The Satoyama experience, however, does not need me to speak for it. As on TripAdvisor, it is rated as one of the top attractions that you can do in all of Japan. And we heard about this one too a little bit in the Jikobuki presentation. Anyone who's familiar with Japan may be aware that they love to rank things. And so, the Gero Hot Spring that you see here, alongside the Arima Hot Spring in Hyogo and Kusatsu Hot Spring in Gunma, is one of the top three hot springs in Japan. It's had quite a reputation within Japan for over 1,000 years, and it combines all the hustle and bustle of a hot springs town with the rural scenery that you could naturally expect from a place like Gifu. Being there is deeply relax relaxing, and the town really comes to life at night when couples, groups of friends, and weird lonely guys like me just shuffle around town, <laughs> enjoying the atmosphere, chatting, and snacking on local foods while moving from one hot spring to another. Or rather, I mean, if you prefer, you can stop to dip your feet in one of the many foot baths that they have around the area. Whereas in a normal city, you might have fountains for decoration. Here you have hot spring fountains, so you can just dip your hand in or your feet and enjoy a little bit of the water. Now hold on a minute, Graham, you might be saying, I know a thing or two about hot springs, and this doesn't sound like enough to make it one of the top three. And you'd be right. I mean, when it comes to hot springs, there is, of course, one thing that matters more than anything else, and that's the water. Gero is well known for its silky smooth water of beauties, which, after bathing in it, leaves your skin feeling just as silky as the water you bathed in. Each hot spring has its own chemical balances and individual properties, so, you know, if you're a bit of a hot springs guru, there's a lot of fun to be had in just getting in the different ones and seeing how they're different. It is a resort, though, so if you were looking for a way to combine hot springs with that oft-desired 
traditional Japanese inn experience, you're going to want to stay the full night. And this uh, cormorant fishing, it's performed on the Nagara River in the cities of Gifu and Seki. And it is one of Gifu's oldest and most honored traditions. The cormorant fishermen that you see on the boat are attached to their birds with strings that are tied around the necks of the birds. They're tied so tight that large fish can't go through, but loose enough so that they can feast on the smaller fish. After they catch a, uh, after they catch a fish, they come back on the boat, the fisherman takes it out of their mouths, and if you happen to be on one of the boats riding alongside of it, they'll feed it to you right there. <laughs> The tradition is kept as it, largely as it was 1,300 years ago, with the fishing performed exclusively at night using the light of torches. And as you can see, the torches are attached to the boat. And in the dark of night, so removed from everything else in the world, many people describe the experience as something like traveling through time. The way that it works in general is that you have the torch light. And in this river sleep ayu, uh, fish that are called ayu. What happens is when since it's important that you do this at night, <laughs> what happens is the ayu are sleeping, and when they see the torchlight, they get scared and they try to scatter. The ayu, uh, the cormorants, seeing the light reflecting off of their scales, know where they are and dive in to catch them. The famous performer Charlie Chaplin came to see it and was so fascinated by it, he decided to see it again. <laughs> and these fish, once again called ayu, they are a type of trout that can only inhabit particularly clear water. And the Nagara River is one of the very few places in the world where this is possible, and the quality of the water is protected by the local people who work together to conserve its ecosystem. This conservation system on the river itself, called the Ayu of Nagara River System, was recently designated a globally important, globally important agricultural heritage site by the Food and Agriculture Organization. Next, we'll move on to another place that is largely frozen in time. We have the Magome Post Town. Located on the Nakasendo Road, which at just over 300 miles long, was an important thoroughfare that connected the old capital of Kyoto and Edo, which we now call Tokyo. People traveling on this road would stop and rest at one of the 69 post towns along it. Of the 69, very few are preserved as well as Magome. While some might have no more than a stone slab in the middle of a town that says what used to be there, Magome still maintains its picturesque appearance with beautiful latticed buildings lining both sides of its 1,000 meter long slope paved with stone slabs. It's connected to another post town uh, in Nagano Prefecture called Sumago. And walking between the two has become quite the popular activity in recent years, particularly amongst Europeans. For those who want a little more than sightseeing on your journey, you can experience a little bit of what life was like for people who walked the same road in the 17th century and beyond. And obviously, no matter where you take, there's lovely pictures to be taken. I took these myself, and I'm no photographer. So I imagine anyone here could do a much better job. And alongside Shirakawa Go, probably our single most famous tourist destination in Gifu is the old castle town of Takayama. There are many reasons for that, one of which, of course, the town is beautiful. And it has a staggering number of very traditional buildings, all located in one compact area. But also because, again, Japan loves lists. This is home to the Takayama Festival, which is rated as one of the three most beautiful festivals in the country. Twice a year, in April and October, the festival floats that are stored throughout the town are brought out and paraded throughout the streets for two whole days. Some floats are equipped with marionettes that perform plays from atop their floats, showing off the remarkable craftsmanship that was possessed by artisans of centuries past. Once again, I feel like I'm talking about UNESCO a lot today, uh, but the festival floats of the Takayama Festival are expected to be designated a UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage next year. And this next one, I actually thought I was going to be bringing you some brand new information, but the, the governor got one up on me. History buffs in the audience might be familiar with the Battle of Sekigahara, which was a large turning point in Japanese history. On October 21st, 1600, the Western Army, led by Ishida Mitsunari, fought against the Eastern Army, led by Tokugawa Ieyasu, for control of the country. Tokugawa emerged victorious, uniting Japan and ushering in an era of relative peace that lasted for over 250 years, which is commonly referred to now as the Edo period. The town of Sekigahara has embraced its history 
and holds annual festivals in October where, alongside other events, they hold a recreation of key scenes from the Battle of Sekigahara. A Japanese civil war, if you will, of course, and that may inspire thoughts of Gettysburg. Certainly, Jap Japan's east-west conflict and America's north-south conflict were remarkably decisive for their respective countries, and they, well, we have actually formed a bond over that. This was supposed to be my brand new information, but as of September 5th, uh, just three short days ago, the town of Sekigahara and the borough of Gettysburg are sister cities, and the historic Sekigahara battlegrounds and the Gettysburg National Military Park are now sister battlegrounds as well. Uh, somebody beat me to the punch on that one. After what you just saw, I don't really know if anybody here needs much more convincing. Uh, but if you want to see the real thing, you can come to Gifu and really enjoy it. I mean, once you get the actual local people involved who have been doing it for a long time, there's a lot to be enjoyed. And also the performances themselves go on for an eternity. So if you liked what you saw, you can see a whole bunch more of it. <laughs> but there are just a couple more little tidbits that I'd like you to keep you in mind. I mean, the first of all is that, as we mentioned, this is an amateur operation. Jikabuki is fair game for kids as well. And so this is a very unique tradition. It usually serves as a prelude to jikabuki performed by adults. Local children perform on the same stage and get all the same excitement and applause. They get the same omuko and ohineri that the grown-ups do. As an observer, it is very nice to just see kids be engaged with local traditions. This is, of course, how they protect it and pass it on for future generations. And it's just nice to see them spending their free time doing something other than watching TV or playing Pokemon Go. <laughs> if you saw Jikabuki today and thought, right on, that's my jam, I have good news for you. Uh, you don't need to sit on the sidelines. In certain theaters in Gifu, you can actually jump in and get in the action. Uh, there are places where they will use the same makeup, put the same clothes on you, and get an instructor to show you how it's done. This is me, <laughs> across multiple photos, doing my best not to smile. Uh, what you can do is you can actually get on stage, they'll have an instructor with you, and act out some scenes. So if you saw what the performers were doing here today and thought that you want to cut a killer mie of your own, then you're in luck. <laughs> Gifu is also a tremendous producer of crafts, and uh, we have what is called minoyaki. Minoyaki refers to all ceramics that are made in Gifu's eastern region of Tono. Minoyaki took off in this area because it has an abundance of everything that you need for ceramics production. You have materials such as clay, and you also have plenty of things that you can use for fuel to keep the kilns stoked. Nowadays, including porcelain, tile, and ceramics, Minoyaki production accounts for over 50% of all ceramics production in Japan. Even more recently, this one is a, a bit strange to me, we're in the bit of a boom of large size ramen bowls called donburi. For this event, we've actually brought with us donburi designed by 25 of Japan's top artists and creators. They're on display on the Sky Room, on the second floor of this very building. And while we unfortunately have no raw ramen to go along with it, uh, as long as you use your imagination a little bit, it's every bit as fun. And also here ours, I believe that this one is actually in the Sky Room, so you can enjoy that one. That was my favorite. And uh, you may have noticed that I've been throwing around the word 1300 a lot. We have a lot of traditions that are exactly 1300 years old. Uh, this one is another one of them. And what you see here is a man performing the technique used in the creation of Japanese paper called washi in Gifu city of Mino. It's a bit different from the wood pulp paper that, I mean, I've always been used to. It's made of different kinds of tree bark, in this case, particularly mulberry. And it's generally softer, yet somehow more durable than regular paper. It is of extremely high quality, and it's been used in the creation of all sorts of many other traditional crafts in Gifu, such as lanterns, umbrellas, and fans, and also some practical and surprising things like towels and socks. They get wet, you dry them off, you use them again, it's no problem, but it's paper. One subset of minowashi, called hon minoshi, which you see in the bottom left here, is paper of a particularly high quality that is used in the restoration of priceless works of art or to create the screen doors that you see in the most famous temples in Nara or Kyoto. <laughs> the techniques used in the creation of Honminoshi, I'm sorry about doing this so many times, it's UNESCO again. Uh, it was designated as a UNESCO Intangible Cultural Heritage in November of 2014. And it's time to get a little bit local. Uh, Gifu and New York have had a bit of a connection for a long time. Uh, Minowashi is obviously very popular in crafts, and many 
people in the artistic community have taken a liking to it as well. One such person was Isamu Noguchi, a half-American, half-Japanese artist who visited uh, Gifu in 1951 and, watching cormorant fishing, was inspired by the light of the torches reflecting off the surface of the water. Then, using the same traditional methods that we use in Gifu, uh, he would create a lantern that he would call akari, which is a word that refers to the light given off by lanterns. He visited Gifu many times thereafter, creating over 200 kinds of akari of all shapes and sizes. There is a festival held in, ev in Mino every October where pieces of akari art that have been submitted by people from across the country are put on display in the old streets of Mino, as you see here. If you can't get there during October, don't worry, there's a museum that's open year round where you can enjoy these same works of art. And if you just can't wait to get to Japan to see them, well, Isamu Noguchi's museum is in Queens. It's across from the Costco, so you can see it tomorrow if you want. <laughs> Next is uh, a work of the world famous artist and architect Shusaku Araka Arakawa, who spent much of his life living in New York. This spot here <laughs> is called the Site of Reversible Destiny. It was created around the theme of expecting the unexpected, or sorry, encountering the unexpected, and it is designed intentionally to throw off your sense of balance and basically just mess with your head. It wants you to rethink the relationship that you have with the world around you. It's called the site of reversible destiny as it was intended to be some kind of apparatus or installation that could be used for humans to escape from their one inevitable fate, which is death. Thinking on what place would be best for this work of art, he decided on the town of Yoro in Gifu Prefecture. Yoro literally means to nourish the elderly, and it is a historic spot in Japanese legend. As we mentioned, Tokugawa Ieyasu brought about the Edo period of Japan, and we are living now in what is called the Heisei period. There existed a Yoro period in the mid-700s, and it was named as such after the empress at the time, whose name was Gensho, visited the area after hearing that the water of its waterfall could be used to restore one's youth. She found the rumors to be true, and named the era of her reign Yoro in its honor. And so then what better place could there be to escape death was his thought process. <laughs> Moving on to a more lighthearted and more evening appropriate topic, Gifu is also fiercely proud of its culinary traditions. And if there is one champion, one king that reigns supreme amongst Gifu cuisine, it is without a doubt Hida beef. Officially holding the title of Japan's best beef for 10 years running, the unbelievable flavor and honestly kind of impossibly soft texture are quite an experience. Makes for a, fantast a fantastic steak, sure, but it's also good when boiled for shabu shabu or even just as a topping on sushi. You'll figure this out yourselves pretty soon. Uh, we've flown some in and you'll all be able to enjoy it later tonight. And I'm not gonna let any single one of you walk out that door until you tell me what you think. We also have some more traditional dishes as well. Uh, I would be amazed if anybody in the audience could even recognize this at a glance. What we have here is called hobazushi. And so you have a, a pile of rice and wild vegetables that are packed onto a magnolia leaf. So it would be an excellent portable snack for the hard worker in ancient times. It even comes complete with its own wrapper. And then there's also gohei mochi, which is a flattened flavored rice cake on a stick that's common in Northern Gifu. There's much more to be enjoyed if you make your way out so consider tonight something of a preview for you. Food is only half of the equation, however, as Gifu also boasts an abundance of delicious sake. Made using the clear waters of Gifu that I mentioned earlier, our sake has also been picking up steam in markets overseas. Right now, uh, we are conducting sake fairs at multiple restaurants throughout New York and getting rave reviews. To celebrate this occasion, as the official arrival of Gifu Sake in New York, we have representatives of 12 different sake breweries here today, and they're all looking forward to hearing what you think. Be it Hida beef, Ayu, or sake, the secret ingredient is none other than Gifu's pristine, limpid water. Surrounded by mountains over 3,000 meters tall, the melted snow that flows down the mountaintops blesses the area with water that Gifu prides itself on. History and traditional culture are alive and well in Gifu, and Gifu makes it its mission to see that these are protected for future generations. I'd love for everyone in this room to find their way to Gifu and understand what that means for yourselves. I guarantee that you're in for an unforgettable experience. Speaking of unforgettable, I had one last thing I wanted to introduce. Gifu is fiercely proud of its sites, of its cuisine, and also of its people. 
Chiyune Sugihara is a man who, during his time as a diplomat during the Second World War, defied orders from his superiors and issued transit visas to Jewish people who were attempting to escape Nazi influence, ultimately saving roughly 6,000 lives. Gifu Prefecture, along with Mr. Sugihara's hometown of Yaotsu, are places that endeavor to spread that same sense of morality, love for humanity, and courage that motivated Mr. Sugihara's selfless deeds. Of course, I won't be speaking too much on that because we have someone here who is much more qualified on that topic. Uh, but I will be at our tourism booth on the ground level for the rest of the night. So if anyone has any questions about what you heard today, would like to learn more about Gifu, or would like help planning a trip, please let me know. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Howard, for sharing all of the authentic and culinary uh, specialties of Gifu Prefecture. Our final speaker tonight is Dr. Sylvia Smoller, professor at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and Manilauf Rosen Chair Emerita. Dr. Smoller is the daughter of Holocaust survivors who were saved by Japanese consul Chiyune Sugihara, whom Graham just mentioned, a native of Yaotsu town in Gifu Prefecture. Dr. Smoller has done extensive historical research on Chiyune Sugihara and has written a novel entitled Rachel and Alex, which includes the story of the consul. She is also the only person to have donated an original visa to the Chiyune Sugihara Memorial Hall in Yaotsu. Please welcome Dr. Smoller to the podium. Well, I'm honored to be here and to have the opportunity to tell you about my gratitude to this remarkable Japanese man, a son of Gifu, and born in Yaotsu, Chiyune Sugihara. Zahor, remember, is a major element of Jewish tradition. Memory is an imperative for survival, both to preserve a dying culture and to learn from it so that the future is not just a replay of the past. And as my generation passes, the remembrance of the Holocaust must be perpetuated by the next generation. And what is most important to remember is that along with all the horrors and all the evil, there were people who stood up to the tide and did the right thing. The Japanese consul Chuno Sugihara was such a person, and I feel privileged to honor him and to tell you about how his courage saved my life. Um, let me just see if I can work this. I was born in Warsaw, Poland, uh, shown on the map here. Uh, and on September 1st, 1939, the Nazis invaded Poland and the Second World War started. Two days later, Britain and France, as well as Australia and New Zealand, declared war on Germany. The United States proclaimed neutrality. On September 17th, the Soviet Union invaded Poland, and the Nazis occupied Warsaw on September 27th and went on to conquer all of Europe. My father, mother, and I fled Warsaw, which was my home, Warsaw in flames from the continual bombing, but not yet fallen. It was sheer chance that my mother and I left with my father. He was advised to leave the city by a former government colleague, but had no intention of taking us to some unknown location to God knows where, because women and children were considered to be safe. It was only the men who would be hunted down. My father managed to get a car from the police station because he had been a government official, and my mother was told to select a chauffeur. Uh, we had already said goodbye to, to my father. According to my mother's story, she selected the most handsome chauffeur. Uh, and it was this chauffeur who urged on my father that he take his wife and small child with them because um, he had taken his own wife outside of Warsaw to the country to escape the, the bombing. And so in a matter of a few minutes, we left with my father. And that was sheer chance. If she had picked another chauffeur, it wouldn't have happened. So we were escaping by car, by freight train in the middle of the night, uh, by horse-drawn cart, and we made our way through small towns and villages, uh, sometimes just the three of us and more often with another small group of refugees. We were going eastward away from the advancing Nazis. We kept moving eastward till we arrived in Vilno, which has several times changed hands between the Russians and the Lithuanians. 
This was our last stop. We could go no further unless we had a visa to another country. We were trapped, as were many of the refugees, all of the refugees who were fleeing Poland and happened to be going east. The Nazis eventually occupied um, all of Europe. You can see the red, uh, 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 the red on this map, which shows all of the uh, Nazi-held territories. Really, all of Europe except Great Britain. Uh, it was in this historical context that Chuna Sugihara was the Japanese consul in Kovno, now known as Kaunas, Lithuania, in August of 1940. Kaunas is very close to Vilnius. Now, Japan at that time was not yet an ally of Germany, but was preparing to become one formally, and you need to know that to know the context in which Sugihara operated. The Japanese consulate was the only one that was open then because the Russians had closed all the other consulates as part of their pact with Germany at the time. Thus, by August 1940, Sugihara was our only hope for survival. We needed a visa to get out of this trap. It happened that a Jewish uh, student of Dutch descent approached a Dutch official in Kono, in Kovno, asking for a stamp to go to Curacao and asking that it be written in his passport that no entry visa for Curacao was required. The Dutch official provided such a visa, and armed with this, um, the student went to Sugihara and asked for a transit visa through Japan, since he had a destination uh, to uh, Curacao. Consul Sugihara gave him that visa, but soon, the word spread around and he was overwhelmed with requests from other Jews for these visas. Many Jews were able to get the Curacao statement stamped in their passport or forged in their passport. And many did not even know where Curacao was. They didn't know it was in the Caribbean. Maybe they didn't even know where the Caribbean was. But it did them no good unless they could get out through Japan. Most of them had no destination other than Japan, and it's most likely that Chuna Sugihara knew that. He wired Japan asking for permission to issue these visas. He was refused permission. More and more Jews were gathering outside the consulate, desperate. He wired Japan again. He was refused permission again, but he decided to do it anyway because we, he knew that we all faced certain death if we could not get out and his conscience dictated that he should help. Now I'm going to give you a quote from Sugihara in 1986, just before, maybe a year before he died, I think it was. Now here's the quote. I myself thought this would be the right thing to do. There is nothing wrong in saving many people's lives. If anybody sees anything wrong in the action, it is because something not pure exists in their state of mind. The spirit of humanity, philanthropy, neighborly friendship. With this spirit, I ventured to do what I did, confronting this most difficult situation. And because of this reason, I went ahead with redoubled courage. He risked a lot by doing this, but he followed the guides of his conscience. Uh, Chuna Sugihara wrote 2,000 such visas, each for a family. This is a, 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 a copy of the official list. You can see it's not on a computer, it's on an old-fashioned typewriter. Anyway, our visa was number 459. My maiden name was Haftka, and Alexander Haftka was my father, and he received that visa. Well, we eventually took that visa and we traveled to Moscow. And when we were in Moscow, my parents went to see the American consulate and they were granted a destination visa to the United States. From Moscow, we took the Trans-Siberian Railroad across Siberia to the port of Vladivostok. <coughs> Excuse me. All throughout that 11-day trip, it was 10 nights, 11 days, my father was terrified that at the next stop, the Russians would take him off the train and arrest him but we arrived safely in Vladivostok. From Vladivostok, we took a, a two-day boat trip on a very rough sea to Japan. We arrived in Tsuruga in December on a very cold day. We stayed in Tsuruga a few days and then went to Kobe, where most of the Jewish refugees were. Uh, the Jewish agency supported us. We stayed in a hotel in Kobe and 
my little memory since I was very small at the time was that I was happy and my parents were not, um, there was no tension anymore. We felt we were safe and uh, there were also a, a lot of other little children so I had company. And, <clears throat> excuse me, the Japanese were very kind to us. In fact, on one trip, well, let me just show you, uh, they took us uh, uh, to visit Kiyomizu Temple in Kyoto, and this is a group of refugees visiting that temple. Um, and once they took us to Tokyo to a department store, and I was astonished that there was a playground on the roof of that department store. That I remember. <laughs> um, uh, uh, this is uh, on the ship from, um, from um, Yokohama, I guess it was, uh, to America, and uh, my parents are dancing uh, there, and that's me on the boat. So this is this is how our journey was from Poland through Russia, all the way through Russia, all the way across Siberia, across um, to Japan, and then finally to the United States. So it was really a trip around the world. A very, very long trip. Uh, that was the beginning of uh, our life in America. My parents struggled to make a living in America, but they, especially my father, placed a great value on education, and eventually I went on to earn my doctorate, though unfortunately my father did not live to see it. As for other members of my family, just to tell you what uh, else was going on, as probably most of you know, my grandparents were killed in a concentration camp. My uncles were hidden by a Polish villager, and one of them joined a partisan group. My aunts were in the most infamous concentration camp, Auschwitz and Majdanek, but they survived. My cousin Michael was the youngest child liberated from Auschwitz, but his brother and father were killed at Auschwitz. He and his daughter Debbie um, let me see if I can get the, yes. They have just written a book about these experiences, his experiences in Auschwitz, which will be published in March, and it's called The Survivors Club. And I was spared these horrors, really because of Sugihara's actions. So the endlessly fascinating question is, why did Sugihara do what he did? Why did he help people whom he did not know, to whom he had no particular connection, but simply because he believed it was the right thing to do. After all, there were others who at best did nothing and at worst helped in the extermination of the Jews. And why was Sugihara different? What forms a character like that who can become a hero when faced with a difficult decision? Well, I believe there are two threads running through the course of events two forces that determine our lives. And I like to put Sugihara's act and my own survival in the context of the interplay between these two opposing forces. On the one hand, there is pure chance. And on the other hand, there's a certain inevitability to a chain of events and to the actions of one person. So let me explain a little what I mean. Chaos theory is a field of science in which one of the areas of interest is prediction of the future, like the weather, for example, the stock market. And one of the central principles is what chaos theory, which is a mathematical theory, calls uh, is, is uh, the sensitive dependence on initial conditions. That's the butterfly effect, a small event in a distant place or in a distant past can lead to far-reaching and perhaps unexpected consequences in the here and now. The flapping of a butterfly's wings in Asia, amplified by a millionfold over space and time, can cause a hurricane in Oklahoma. Sugihara's act of decency in 1940 enables me to be here today. When Sugihara saved my life, he saved not only my life, my parents' life, and all those refugees, but also my then unborn son's life, and all that he now contributes to the world, and my granddaughter. Now multiply this by 40,000 descendants. By now, it's probably more than 40,000. 
who are Sugihara survivors or Sugihara descendants of survivors. Consider how many scholars, artists, teachers, scientists, musicians, statesmen, doctors, craftsmen, uh, sake makers, <laughs> hido beef growers. How many, how many uh, Consul Sugihara saved? Chance encounters shape the future, and no life hangs on small coincidences. In the story of all survivors of the Holocaust, there are innumerable small coincidences. In my case, we were in Kaunas at that particular time, in that small two to three week period when Sugihara was signing those visas. Had we arrived later, we would have perished. Had Sugihara left earlier, we would have perished. And so, of course, I'm grateful for every day of life. But all these coincidences, all those flappings of butterflies' wings, would not be enough to account for Sugihara's act of moral courage. What was the necessary element? Well, you guessed it. It was his character. He was quite simply a decent man. And so I suspect this ultimate moral choice was not an isolated event. He had been preparing it for it all his life by the many, many small choices he must have made along the way. And when this major decision point came, he simply acted within his character. And that brings me to the concept of what I call small decencies, what, what I think we must pro promote in young people and in, in the generation and the new generation. Most of us, fortunately, are not faced with choices of the magnitude of Sugihara's. But probably many of us throughout our lives are faced with these many small choice points, which may seem insignificant at the time, but which form part of the fabric and pattern of who we become. Character develops slowly, small choice by small choice, so that should oneself find oneself in a situation where a large choice is required, one is prepared and one acts out of a lifetime habit of doing the right thing. It's the accumulation of many small choices and many small decencies across a lifetime. Decencies to people who intersect our lives, whether they're family or strangers, that define us. And that, I think, is an aspect of Sugihara's life that's worth aspiring to and worth teaching our children. To get back to Sugihara and the question of chance versus character, it was chance my family and the 2,000 others were in the place where Sugihara was in August 1940. And it was his character that saved us, a character shaped by all the small decencies of his life, culminating in this great decency that saved 6,000 lives. Now, I just want to show you, I had the privilege of donating my father's passport with the Sugihara visa to the Memorial Museum in Yaotsu. This is a copy of the passport. And this is the um, uh, uh, ribbon cutting of the Sugihara Memorial Museum in Yaotsu. Mrs. Sugihara is there in the yellow dress cutting the ribbon, and the uh, uh, mayor, uh, the, the governor of Gifu actually is next to her, and then the um, Israeli ambassador, and I'm at the very end in the black dress, also helping to cut the ribbon. And this is uh, Yuko Kawai, who is in the audience here, my late husband, and I at the Sugihara Memorial in Yaotsu. These, these are such beautiful, uh, um, it's such a beautiful memorial. It's set in the mountains, and the gold columns that you see here are chimes. So when the wind blows through them, they make this lovely, lovely sound. And this is a picture when I visited Gifu and uh, <coughs> went to see a, 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 a ukai. I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly. Ukai? Is that correct? Ukai? And uh, my husband and I are sitting on the boat eating the fish that was just caught off there on the left, just at that very moment. So I have wonderful memories of this beautiful memorial and this beautiful place, and I hope you get to see it and uh, uh, keep in mind the butterfly effect and how what we all do all of the time may affect a lot of people. Thank you very much. <laughs>